Hi folks, I'm Richard Friedman and welcome to my political cartoon countdown for July 22nd, 2021. Haven't been around for a while uh, and it's good to be back. And I just wanna kind of do a moment of silence for those people who were lost in Surfside and a little moment of silence for them, their families and all those workers who, de who dedicated themselves to that tremendous task of recovery and, and searching, uh, initially searching and then recovery. So I want a moment of silence for that. Okay, and uh, now we're back. I just would like to remind you about uh, my, my books and uh, that I have available and I have another one coming out soon uh, for the first half of, of 2021. And um, I always like to uh, tell you a little about myself. I've been doing these cartoons way back through uh, President uh, George W. Bush, through Obama and through Trump. So I've gone through three, three presidents and I was doing before then, I was doing here and there some work. So I've been doing this a while and uh, just Recent, not only uh, not a couple of years ago, three when the President Trump became president, I uh, I started considered writing a book because of the the situation there, and I thought it would be interesting to write a book about that. So anyway, uh, I want to tell you, uh, I have a series of books, and I always like to go back and um, reflect. Oh, by the way, if you want to see my cartoons, there at you can look go on Twitter. And it's Bronx cartoonists that handle RJF cartoons. I'm originally from the Bronx. And, uh, and I always like to tell you the stories about the Bronx. You know, um, uh, well, anyway, uh, the thing is that I always uh, used to enjoy living there. And, uh, and it was a great place to live until, until I graduated from college and, and, and couldn't find a job. And I had to go somewhere else to uh, to find work, and I did, and um, and that's that. And uh, I would like to uh, show you go back in time to a uh, a year ago. This 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 is my 2019 book from July to December, and this is going back now two years, two years ago, and what was happening on this date around this approximately this date two years ago from a cartoon. And uh, here, here is a flash, kind of a flashback. Whoop, here we go, here we are. This is President, former President Trump watching Boris Johnson. Who was then the Prime Minister of England. Who still is? Who still is? He still is. <laughs> he still is. He still is. It's just that President Trump is no longer the president of the United States. So, here, here is that interaction. Trump says, "New British Prime Minister Johnson will quote will be great," praising Boris Johnson as the tr British, the Britain Trump, British Trump. They like me over there. That's what they wanted. That's what they need. Boris Johnson will bring a bit of Britain. Trump to Downing Street. That was July 23rd, 2019. And here is former President Trump watching the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Okay? Bring it in close. And he's thinking to himself, okay? Nice, as in those, those, those shoulder pads, you know, up there, real big, you know? So he's thinking to himself, you see, here he's thinking to himself in that, in that suit. And he says, Boris will be great. I will even help, help him to develop a fantastic Brexit deal. Got to have the name of his tailor. Great shoulder pads. Make Sleepy Joe look like Forrest Gump in 2020. Okay. <laughs> Those are the shoulder pads. Of, of Boris Johnson, and here he's thinking about that suit on himself. Mm -hmm. 
And there you see the Oval Office there, the background of the fireplace, and George Washington, picture George Washington up there, up there on the wall. Okay. So that's a sample, just one sample. So that was, this is a 2019 book, edition two from July to December. Here is the, uh, my, my 2020 book, which is, encompasses the entire year of 2020. See, if you remember, so I, I, I try to just show you some stuff. You know, I got, Jack, I got bringing a lot of, here's Jack Benny. I brought back Jan, Jack Benny in there. As the ghost of Jack, Pen, Jack Benny. Comedian from a long time ago. Here's President Trump uh, on the golf course. This is the 2020 book. Okay. Here's the former President Trump at the, at the CDC. Here's President, former President Trump with Jim Jordan. Okay, here's former President Trump comment, commenting to Mick Mulvaney while, while watching uh, the majority leader, uh, Chuck Schumer, on the screen there. Remember Mick Mulvaney? Okay. Here's, here's former President Trump with the village people. YMCA. It's fun to stay at the YMCA. There, I did that. Here's his bar, watching his attorney general. Okay. Here's a bunch of, uh, of tr Trump fans driving in their truck over a Biden bus during the campaign, 2020. Okay, so you get a glimpse of this 2020 book. Here is uh, edition one of uh, 2019, the first book from 2019. Here we got Dick Cheney in the Straits of Hormuz. <laughs> We have here the, John Bolton here. Okay. Here's Rudy Giuliani, attorney for President's personal former. President, personal, former President Trump's personal attorney. Here's Wa uh, Wallace uh, talking to uh, uh, Kellyanne Conway um, fo on Fox News Sunday. Chris Wallace here. Chris, there's Chris, there's Chris Wallace. Okay. As a, this was a funny one. This was a President Trump in the office where, where he uh, happens here. Here is the uh, where his former his former Attorney General. Uh, that was um, the man he used to call Mr. Magoo. Is here. Uh, what, uh, this was uh, we. Uh, uh, I forget. I forget so many attorney generals. I forget. I forget his name now. This is Andre Spencer. But anyway, here he is looking for a new job, and he's he's washing windows. Okay. Okay. That 
is that okay? So anyway, here's former President Nixon. I'm gonna flash back with President Nixon here. Here's President Nixon. Okay, so you get the idea. I try to bring history in, in into, into perspective. This is my first book here. Whoop. Here's my first book. This also this this encompassed the uh, the run up to the election in 2016, going through two years, 2017 and 2018, and the run up to the election. The election. So I had Democrats in here too. I have, I have this book really encompasses a lot of time here. Okay, just this is the uh, this is the uh, Kavanaugh. Now, this bud's for you, President Trump. Yeah, remember the Supreme Court issue there. We, he did get on the court. Okay. Here's Newt Gingrich. He gets in there. I think when we talk about the Republican Party, no matter what you say, you can't leave out Newt Gingrich uh, for... for or way back when he 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 initial one put in the, the great Republican Revolution, you know where that went. But you got you, you can't talk about the Republican Party historically without mentioning Newt Gingrich and Barry Goldwater as well. You, you got you have to you have to understand the whole thing, the whole spectrum of, of how we got to where we are today. Okay, here's Rand Paul. Well, here's Pooh Bear taking a shot of Pooh over the Chinese uh, don't like him, so he's, he's trying to score some points with the Chinese who, who banned Pooh. So, there's, there's Pooh. There's John Wayne. There's Putin. Okay. So, okay. You got Walter Cronkite in there. The ghost of Walter Cronkite. Well, try to get creative, you know. So I hope you would, if you want to look at, at my books and see, get the preview, it's like going to a political cartoon Disney World. You just go to Richard's Books of Political and it's no spaces and no apostrophe S. Yes. Just no, no punctuation whatsoever and no spaces. Richard's Books of Political Cartoons .com, and there's a link if you want to buy the book. You can order it off of Amazon from the link on my website, Richard's Books of Political Cartoons .com. Okay, so let's get started now with the countdown. I have today because we've been a while, so instead of five, we got six. I don't want to make it too long, you know, so I added an extra one to try to encompass as much time as I could. This is, this, we go from the least, to, I'm sorry, least popular, to up, for up to number one. You know, like Casey and Casey used to do, if you lived in New York, the, the top 40, where we do the top six starting out. This is starting out with New Metal Says, number six, working our way up to number one. Okay, so here it is. There's Jim Jordan, there's Nancy Pelosi, and there is McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy. And they are standing in front of the Capitol, awaiting the first, this is the first, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, House Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi, and Representative Jim, Jim Jordan in front of the Capitol, ahead of first meeting of January 6th Select Committee. So I was jumping the gun a little bit here, in assuming that it was going to move along pretty good, but it didn't. So we never got to, we never got to this point. But had we gotten there, this is what I'm hypothesizing could have been. Given McCarthy selects Jordan, we, I knew that was going to happen. That was a given right there. And Pelosi doesn't veto his pick. 
Uh, I knew, well, that was a big question. She has, as of today, she has vetoed uh, that pick. And, and Jim Jordan, along with uh, the other, um, we'll, we'll get to that another time. There's this stuff on that. But, but, but Jim Jordan is off uh, the, the committee, and, uh, and it was interesting to hear him speaking earlier today. He was like blaming, blaming the whole thing, the whole big question. You know, the question is, the $64,000 question is, when, why wasn't there security on January 6th at the Capitol? That's the fundamental question Jim Jordan wants to know. You know, I say to Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan, that's like saying, why weren't there ships around when the Titanic hit the iceberg? You know, the Titanic hit the iceberg, there should have been ships around, should have gotten there much quicker. Had they had the Maconi, they had the Maconi SOS, they sent an SOS, they blew up, they sent up shots, those rockets in the sky, they had those guys working in the telegraph office there, telegraphing stuff out. You know, the California, you could see the lights from the California. Why didn't the California come? Why didn't they come? People saw the lights off a ship off the way back, and they said, well, why, 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 did, why not? Why didn't they come? That is a fundamental question we have to answer. Never mind, there weren't enough lifeboats. That was a little bit of a mistake, not enough lifeboats. Number two, they may have been going a little too fast with all that ice around, you know, and they got reports that there was ice in the area, but they were going full speed ahead because uh, the, uh, the president of the company wanted to break records to New York City. Never mind about that. Never mind. Never mind about that. Never mind that some of the rivets may have not have been as, as tight as they could have been, you know, the kind of rivets they use on the bottom. Never mind about that. Never mind that they put the ship in reverse, which, which, which made it worse. And they should have, if they would have gone forward and smashed into the, head on into the iceberg, it might have been a little different. But they said they put it in reverse, and then they uh, tried to steer around it, and boom, they, they scraped the thing, and down she went. In a couple, two and a half, three hours, she was at the bottom of the ocean. But forget all about that stuff, you know? The important thing here is where was the California, and how come it took the Carpathia so long to get there, you know? And so to rescue the people that survived, you know, they didn't get there until 4 o'clock in the morning or so to pick up the survivors. They should have they been there a long time earlier. That's like, that's what Jim Jordan is basically saying here, you know? I mean, uh, okay. So anyway, so that was a little sloppy, though, because they didn't have enough lifeboats. That's for sure. <laughs> so anyway. Here is the cartoon. Okay, so given McCarthy selects Jordan and Pelosi doesn't veto his pick, and given Senator Mitch McConnell had urged Senate Republicans to block the original independent commission to investigate the pro Trump insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. So the original in independent commission would have been a bipartisan group. Uh, equal representation of Democrats and Republicans, which nobody could have balked at because it would have been on solid ground. You couldn't say it was politicized because you had an equal amount of Republicans and equal amount. They didn't want no part of that one. You see, they said no way. So they didn't want that because, again, they're rationalizing here that they're going to, Democrats just want to hang Trump and they want to blame him on this and that and say this and that and so forth. So that's it. And then now they're talking about security, and they're adding that on as another layer of, uh, of, of their defense. You know? So anyway, this was July 8th, 2021. So here's how it might have gone, you see? So here's McCarthy right over here, and he's saying, Madam Speaker, that's Pelosi, there is Jim Jordan right on time. So you're right on time. There's Jim. And he's got his Trump sign up for 2024. He's ready for 2024. Jim Jordan's ready for 2024, ready. Uh, Trump in 2024, hey, there is a sign. And then Pelosi gets pissed at this and says, that Trump sign makes this a, a circus, is making this into a circus, that Trump sign. We're not here to discuss the political campaign for 20, we're here to decide what happened there, including uh, President Trump was there, and he did, he did encourage these people, to say it mildly and diplomatically, he did offer some encouragement uh, for them to go down to the Capitol, you know? So anyway, and, here, and, then, and then here comes McCarthy retorting, how can you say that? Here comes Mitch. So the circus, 
there's a circus, the circus elephant, you know, also the symbol of the Republican Party. You know, it's a double, double meaning there. And here comes the elephant with Mitch is, is pushing forward the elephant. And it looks like he's about to jump on the elephant and take a ride through to, to add to the circus atmosphere here. That's Mitch. There you have it. There's the Capitol, the American flag, Jim Jordan, Nancy Pelosi, and McCarthy. This this ain't this ain't no circus. Here comes Mitch with the with the, with the elephant. You know. <laughs> okay, there you have it. Okay. Numero seis, number six. Number five. Here we have Representative Louis Gomer, Gomer from Republican from Texas. And here we have the Fox News. Uh, st <laughs> we have here, uh, what's the name? Um, well, we'll get to that. Rep I'm going to read it to you. Representative Louis Gomer, Republican Texas, embraced Tucker Carlson. Right. Embraces Tucker Carlson's, this is a Fox News, conspiracy theory that the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol building was masterminded by the FBI. Now, Gomer's saying the FBI did this. It, go, it feeds into the narrative that why wasn't there security there? The FBI called the security off, this and that and all this. It all feeds in, you know, like flowing, like, like it's, it's like a, a uh, it's like a budding, uh, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire there. They're all putting it in there. So why on the attack on the Capitol building with mastermind by the FBI, suggesting that unindicted co-conspirators could actually be FBI operators. So there are people who are involved who, are, who haven't been indicted, that they're saying, and they're, and they're questioning why they weren't indicted, okay? Okay. And Gomer goes on to call for an investigation of FBI involvement. So he's, take, he's taking the jump, saying that because people weren't indicted, that means the FBI was involved. That's, you know, that's their reasoning despite voting with his fellow Republicans against bipartisan legislation to establish a commission to investigate the Capitol insurrection. So he voted also against this bipartisan legislation. They had to make a law to establish the commission. First, you need the law to establish it, and that sanctions it, and then you do the commission. So they want to know part of that. It's Gomez, too. So, but, so, so here is on Fox News. Here's Tucker Carlson. This is word for word from Tucker, word for word. You know, I don't like to put words in people's mouth, you know. Fox News Channel. There's a Fox News Channel. There's Tucker there. There he goes. And he's saying, but strangely, some people who participate, very strange, some, some people who participated in the, in the riot haven't been charged. The government calls these people unindicted co-conspirators. That means that in potentially every case, they're FBI operatives. That means every person who wasn't indicted is potentially an FBI operative, because they're not, there's no proof that they weren't, so they potentially they are, you know. So that's their reasoning, and 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 here is here goes Gomer, watching that, Representative Gomer, and he's saying, my friend Tucker here has the Capitol scoop on the House floor. I will demand to know what the FBI knew and when they knew it. That comes right out of the Nixon playbook when they were talking about Nixon when Sam Irwin said. What what went the president know? When when did he know it? So it, it kind of borrows that uh, Louis was around then, you know. So <laughs> and when did they know it about the January sixth? Forget the damn dumb, the, the damn dumb and stupid insurrection shit, you know. So he's saying all that stuff about insurrection is a bunch of nonsense. We got to get to the FBI, just like <laughs> just like this morning, we heard uh, Jim saying he wants to find out why there wasn't more security. Who blew the security? And, and now Nancy Pelosi's not in charge of security. It's not her task. It's not her, she's not, it's not on, in her pay, on her pay grade to be checking out on, social, on, the, on the security of the Capitol. But he wants to know, he wants, he's, it, it, that's the whole thing. Shifting the blame, shifting it, you know? And, and, and you know? Just like going back to, I say, I made an analogy to the Titanic. We've got to find out why those ships didn't get there. Why weren't they there in time? Never mind that there weren't enough lifeboats. That's just the thing, you know, there weren't enough lifeboats. They want to make the, the deck, they want to make the deck attractive to people. They want to see lifeboats. Nobody wants to go on a beautiful cruise and, and have to look at lifeboats. They can't see the ocean. So, so what? So what? There's no lifeboat. You know? 
but the ships, they weren't there, you know, so it's, it's kind of like that. Okay, so here we go, and here we have now an interesting thing here. This is our mystery general, who Trump is, who, uh, a mystery general. I'm going to leave this to your imagination, okay, because I don't want to, I don't want to get in any trouble accusing people of something, uh, you know, of making things up or something like that. I'll let you use your imagination on this one, you know. The mystery general here at the Capitol, court, ready to do an insurrection with the, with the Trump 2020 flag for 2020, bring back Trump in August. You know? <laughs> so here goes. Former President Donald Trump responds to excerpt from book of his chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. Okay, so Mark Milley's come out with a book, and he's made some allegations um, about the last days of former President Trump, that he, he uh, was concerned that the former president might launch a coup. That's what he, that's what he said, you know. So but his, his, this, is, this is, again, that's his view. You know, there's no, there's no recording of it, and there's no documentation of it except for Milley's recollection. So, but General Milley's a very honorable general, and listening to him today, and always when I listen to him, I, I, he, he seems like a very honorable and uh, intelligent and dedicated um, uh, general to, to the cause of America. But that's up to you to decide. That Milley worried that Trump, then president, would try to use the military to attempt a coup after the 2020 election. Trump responded, so ridiculous, sorry to inform you, but an election is my form of coup. So he, a coup. So he's saying, President Trump is retorting back saying, I never do a coup, but if I never do a coup. I do, my, my, way, my way of a coup is through election, you know? And if I was going to do a coup, and if you decided down the road, you know, you never know what's going to, we'll see what happens, you know? We'll see what happens if I decide to decide, someday may decide to do a coup. I mean, that's what, that's what you know, I'm, ex, you know, I'm ex, extracting that kind of reasoning, you know? So one of the last people I would want to do it with is General Mark Milley. He, he wouldn't want Milley along for his coup, as a General Milley along with his, for his coup. Uh, he'd, he'd like some other general. Trump imagines first general. So he's imagining the first general he would want along. Milley would be the one of the last generals, former President Trump, uh, saying he'd ima he's imagining the first general he want. So here it is, the first general he want. And I say, do you use your imagination? As if, and then with the tank going into the White House to claim former President Trump president in August with the Trump 2020. So there, there's, that he won the election legitimate, that President Trump is really the, won the election in 2020, and he's reclaiming his rightful position as president in August. And there, there goes that general, his, Trump's number one general, who would be in charge of a coup if he was to do a coup. But he's, he hasn't said he was doing a coup, but if he was to decide to do a coup, this would be his number one general. So I'll let you, let you uh, use your imagination there. Here's a capital. Here we have it. Here it goes. Okay, uh, moving along here. Wow. All right, there's a lot of reading. I, I, I had to include this, though, because I, I thought this, this, this did well, and it was right up there. And uh, here, here, here it is. I'm going to try to go quickly through it. House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy meets with Donald Trump at the former president's bed in New Jersey. This was only recently a resort. So what, what I'm saying here is that McCarthy uh, went on his own, his own volition to meet with President Trump in New Jersey, you know, which is, you could say, like the, the summer, the summer White House, <laughs> or was the summer White House during the days of former President Trump, you know, as opposed to the Mar-a-Lago, the winter White House. I mean, kind of think, think of it that way as best, Bedminster resort. Okay, so 
So, New Jersey. The meeting coming the day after the select committee investigating January 6th Capitol riot said it will hold its first public hearing. Selecting a deadline for McCarthy to choose who will represent the GOP on the committee. So, so here, here is my uh, hypothesis. My hypothesis is that, for, that they both had decided to meet now because it was on the horizon, this uh, selection of the committee and former President Trump and McCarthy. And McCarthy wanted to assure President Trump that he wasn't going to pick the likes of anybody like the likes of Liz Cheney on her, Liz Cheney's team. And Trump wanted to make his suggestion who he should pick. So it was kind of like developing a meeting of the minds of, of who would be on the committee between uh, McCarthy and former President Trump. A meeting of the minds, this was like a meeting of the minds, uh, no formal contract, but a meeting of the minds between the, the House Minority Leader and former President Trump, who's no longer in the, in the government, but he exerts his influence over the party. So in essence, you have President, former President Trump probably is now, by de facto, a, 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 an advisor, uh, an influencer in our government because the people are following him. So I don't think, I don't remember a time in history where you had a, a, a leader who was above the party, more important than the Republican Party. They don't, these people don't identify as Republicans. To my view, they don't identify as Americans, they identify as Trumpicans. You know, <laughs> and everything serves that 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 uh, that that force. You know, that's what it seems like, and and that's what it seems like. Mitch McConnell and everybody else. It's what it seems like. So anyway, so here here it goes, committee. Because if I here here here's the uh, setting a deadline for McCarthy to choose who will represent the GOP on the committee. And Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene saying she wants a seat on Pelosi's January 6 committee because it needs fighters. So Marjorie Taylor Greene has gotten in on the act, saying she, want, she wanted to be on the committee and because it needs strong people like her, okay? Given Pelosi's veto right to his picks, it expected McCarthy would select less controversial figures than Greene. How it might have gone. Now, how it might have gone is like this. So there they are. Here's former President Trump. And there's McCarthy sitting there. At Bedminster, New Jersey. And Trump says, How's it going, Kevin? You sure did a fantastic job in asking the bit, that bitter, horrible Liz Cheney. Now it's time to cut down Pelosi with the Dems. We have to think big. You select Marjorie Taylor Greene for the January 6th Select Committee? Sure, Pelosi will veto her. But we fire up the base and we get Pelosi smoking mad like a barbecue, smoking like a barbecue, you know? And there's Pelosi smoking. And then, we, and then we have here Kevin McCarthy saying, fantastic, Mr. Mr. President, but I would take a lot of heat from that smoke. Dems are, are my ass to take action on Green's behavior. She's been saying a lot of stuff and doing a lot of things, upsetting Democrats and upsetting a lot of people, saying things that are just from, from, from nowhere, you know, all the wild theories and this and that, following people around and everything like that that she had done in the past. I don't know, but I don't know specifics, but just based on her, her track record, okay, on, my, on Green's behavior. They would call me, if Dems are on my ass to take action on Green's behavior, they would call me your lapdog if I appointed her to the committee, you know, because it would be, it never would, policy would never permit it, it would be, you know, it, it would clearly show McCarthy was, was really, um, you know, in, in, in Trump world, uh, you know, 150%, 250%. Given if a little heat from the dem stops you, uh, like on January 6th, you know, when he said to McCarthy when he was calling out for help in his office and they were climbing through his window, he said, you're, Trump said to him, I think you're more upset about the election. I think that the people out there, the writers, are more upset about the election than you are. So he repeats that here. That sounds like Riders were more upset about the election than you to say and not go ahead to to pick uh, to pick this um, Audrey Taylor Green. So there you have it, former President Trump and McCarthy at a, at their pre pre at their pre uh, 
at their meeting just ahead of the, uh, the, the selection of the committee. Okay. All right. You know, I'm, I'm moving along quick. I don't I want to, I want to, you know, get you to, I don't want to bore people. And I just, here we go. Now, here we have um, former President Donald Trump has vision, longtime CFO of his Trump organization, Alan Weisselberg. That's chief financial officer. CFO is chief financial officer. And Weisselberg's been there a long time, you know. They, they say he knows where all the, the financial bodies are buried. You know, that means all the books and everything. You know, that's what they say. Alan Weisberg flips of his Trump organization. Alan Weisberg flips at his low. Donald Trump's vision, longtime CFO of his Trump organization. Alan Weisberg flips at Lower Manhattan Criminal Court. So here's the court, you see? And Weisberg's flipping at the court. And here's President Trump then in Mar-a-Lago. And, he, and he's watching. And he's imagining this. And there goes Weisberg flipping. And then he's starting to talk, you know. And Trump is, former President Trump is thinking about that. And there goes Weisselberg flipping out over the court. He's flipping. This is the courthouse here in Lower Manhattan that he's flipping out of. And there goes Weisselberg. He flipped. Okay. <laughs> he hasn't flipped yet. Okay. And then, and the, and the Trump organization itself is also being charged on an alleged tax evasion conspiracy. And given Weisselberg's first question to his legal defense team was, how much jail time, time am, I go, am I looking at amid prosecutors ratcheting up the pressure? So they're putting pressure on Weisselberg. That, you can be sure, is true. And then here's President Trump, former President Trump, watching that. He's watching Weisselberg for, doing his flip out of the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. He goes, shit, Weisselberg is flipping. What a stiff, what a stiff. He could have been Treasury Secretary in August when I will be reinstated as president. No pardon for Weisselberg. Good landing, Weisselberg. And here he goes. Okay. All right, here's El Numero Uno. Here we have Mary Tyler. Mary, I always say Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> what a mistake. Mary Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> Okay. Here we go. There she is. Watching President Trump. Here he signed. This is when GOP Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who last January appeared to blame California wildfires on space lasers from an international banking firm with a Jewish family name, saying the family would benefit from such fires. So, Nance, so um, Marjorie Taylor Greene said there were lasers being shot down from outer space by this family who, who went up there in outer space to shoot lasers into California to benefit themselves economically from the fires in some way, shape, or form. So that's what she said back then. And in the context of what's happening now with the space race, I put the two and two together. And former President Donald Trump taking credit for the space race of billionaires. So former President Trump did say that because of him, uh, the space race, he, he really sparked the space race between these two billionaires by letting them use facilities, uh, the, the NASA facilities, and by encouraging them to do this on their own, you know? So of putting himself into a, a Kennedy role, you know? We go, we, go to, we go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. So President Trump is trying to, to get on the, the Kennedy wagon, in a sense, to say, well, I like John F. Kennedy, I, who, who, who America made the commitment to go to the moon, I was the same way with these two billionaires. I sparked them into this competitive race to, to launch into outer space. I said, let the billionaires do it. They have the means. We help them all we can. And then it took, just took off, and that was it. You know, they got the, they got the whole thing, you know. So that's his uh, approach. Amid Green watching, okay, so he's taking credit for space for billionaires, good part by his below signing of the defense bill authorizing the Space Force. So he did, he did authorize the Space Force to go into outer space. That's a different thing. That This is a Space Force, uh, an independent, uh, a un, a independent unit of our military. You know, At the time, he, he said they were separate but equal to the Air Force, something like that. You know, he used that word separate and equal. You know, uh, that's a... Uh, <laughs> you know. That's part of the vocabulary there, you know. Amid 
Representative Green watching video of that from December. So, so she's watching this from December when, when he signed that, okay, creating uh, the, the Space Force. So here's Green, Representative uh, Marjorie Taylor Green, watching former President Trump showing up with his signature there. There's his signature on the bill, which establishes, which established back then in 2019, the United States Space Force. Okay, there it is. President Trump's signature, and there it is. President Trump, the American flag. There's Mary Tyler Green here. Mary Tyler Green. <laughs> Marjorie Taylor Green. Well, I, I must I really like that Mary Tyler Moore. I used to watch her every Saturday night. It was, it was right after All in the Family, those two shows that I never missed. <laughs> I really liked Mary Tyler Moore. I liked that lady a lot. She was a, so anyway, uh, Minneapolis, uh, <laughs> you know. Anyway, there it is. Uh, so there's. And then she says, when President Trump is reelected in 2024, so Mary, Mary, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene is basically, I heard her say this, that she's advising people not to get too, too emotional and new, new, too charged up if President Trump doesn't become President in August, you know. Just cool it. If he doesn't become a President in August, you know, it might not happen. We, we really haven't got this peg yet. So don't get your hopes up too high. But we're going to do it in, in 2024. We're going to be back there. So that was what she did say. She did say that. Some, you know, paraphrasing what she said. So don't get your too high, hopes up high for August, you know. I don't want to disappoint a lot of you people. So, you know, we, we hope it happens, but we can't be too sure right now. So, but again, we are looking for 2024. When President Trump is reelected in 2024, if that family of rich Jewish bankers uses space travel to fire their lasers on California, President Trump will kick their asses back to Earth with his space force. So President Trump, if those, those, that Jewish, rich Jewish uh, family goes out, out of space, now we have a space force to send their lasers down on, to start fires in California with their space lasers, then we have the space force now to wipe them out and kick their butts back to Earth immediately. All right, folks, that does it for my cartoon countdown. A little out of practice here. Haven't done it in a while. Again, that, that, was, that was for, as, as respect for those people who, who went down in, the, uh, in that uh, great tragedy there, you know, uh, in Surfside, those buildings. I, can't, I just can't phantom what it would have been, what it been like to sleep in your bed and just boom, wake up in a heap, heap of rubble going down. They think they were dreaming, having a nightmare. And there and there and they say this must be a nightmare or something, and they're going down into that. I I mean, it, it just uh, it's you know it just it's good. It's, well anyway, you know I I, I I think back, you know it thought I thought back to buildings, uh, you know that that I that I lived in and everything growing up, and comparing it to the structures of today, and I, I remember. Like that, that building I lived in on 1372 Nelson Avenue in the Bronx, you know, uh, that that building. You, I think you, the only thing that would have taken that building out was a, was an atomic bomb landing on it. Then it would have gone. I mean, the walls were like concrete. You could now they have sheet rock, and you they call it sheet rock. And you go, boom, you put your, if you wanted, really wanted to, you could put your fist through the wall. That those were those were they had like. It was like a, a, a popcorn in thing, and, a, and it was really hard concrete. So even even if, if the beams failed, you, the walls would hold up the place because everything was concrete. Everything was 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 rock solid, you know. You, and you had your fire escapes there. I remember my mom for my birthday. She it was, it was too big a turkey because her relatives were coming. She couldn't fit it in the refrigerator. She chose to take the turkey and put it out on the fire escape, and in in in, you know, in the winter time, uh, for my birthday, and she would. Put it out on the fire escape, the turkey, and open up the big steel, going up and with friends going up and climbing the, the uh, fire escapes, those steel fire escapes. Everything was steel and concrete, you know, and it was, you felt like, wow, this is, this is like, and now these buildings, you know, but the thing is that this, this is, this is, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that because they're, they're using sheetrock instead of that, I'm saying this was clearly an extraordinary situation that happened here, and I don't expect, to, uh, to, to, to see this, but they are taking precautions. But I'm saying here, 
is that just by comparing it in my own mind, thinking back. So I'm sure the, the vast majority of buildings are not going to fall down. And they were built by reputable uh, companies. Did, did, but again, you turn it over to, to, to boards and things like that, and you know, you don't take care. So anyway, I just want to, I don't want to push this one too hard. I was just thinking back to those poor people, and I just couldn't get out of here, out in front of people, and start um, doing this until, until it was pretty well. The dust had settled pretty good, and it has settled good, and we've got to move on and watch out and be aware of where things happen around in our environment and be aware, and we can't make the assumption that the people are looking out. So that's basically what I'm saying. I'm not throwing bricks at, or stones at any developers or buildings or anything like that. So I just, just be aware of your environment. That's basically what I'm saying. And I wish all the best. And we got this new Delta thing out there now. So wear your mask uh, in, in when, you, when you feel it's the right thing to do. Don't don't burn your mask like they used to burn the draft cards. You know, I remember when I was growing up. You see kids grow. I never burnt my draft card. I wasn't too, I wasn't looking forward to going to Vietnam. Lucky for me, the war ended when I when I graduated. It just ended then. Around, and I, I never I had a low lottery number, but I never got drafted. I never burnt my card. But a lot of people I feel are well, are, are burning their masks now and saying it's all enough of this stuff now. You know, I got, I got my shots or, or, or this and that. You need your mask, folks, and you need to, to those folks who get vaccinated, you need to get vaccinated. And you need to apply just common sense and stay well, eat well, and get enough sleep. And I wish you all the best. And until next time, take care, folks. And God bless you and God bless America.